Welcome to Pastor Bill's Classroom. This study is in the Acts of Jesus, Lesson 20, Following God's Lead. Good afternoon, everybody out there, wherever you are. Hope uh, you're doing well. Hope this video finds you healthy and uh, uh, prospering in every sense, especially spiritual sense. We're going to be together here as we continue in Acts. We're in our 20th study together on the middle of the week. Uh, study from uh, from my house here and uh, I'm enjoying it. I hope you are and I hope God's blessing you through it. I know every time the Word of God is open there is a blessing and there's an opportunity for us to grow and change and uh, be directed and we're going to be certainly looking to God to bless us and open and direct our eyes today. We're in, again in Acts chapter 8 and we're going to be down in verse 1 beginning. We're going to be running through quite a bit of chapter 8 here and so uh, just have your have your Bibles open there, and we're going to be looking at them in just a minute. I want to start you out with a story. There was a young pilot who was past the point of no return, basically in a weather situation. He had just recently, uh, the ink wasn't even dry on the document, said that he was able to fly by the instruments, and he flies in this massive fog bank as he's headed into uh, the airport where he's supposed to land. Now, this is an airport in a metropolitan area. Uh, he's never been there before. And now the conditions are, uh, you know, there's, there's fog from the moon all the way to the ground, seemingly. And so uh, he had not totally appreciated the fact that his flight instructor had told him to, to make sure and memorize the rule book, the flying rule book. But boy, was he appreciating it now. And uh, looking at his instruments and knowing that he was on a vector headed towards the airport he knew pretty soon he's going to be hearing the voice of the air traffic controller and so before too long uh here he goes and so flying with uh with listen the rule book in his head and the air traffic controller in his ears uh he landed the plane and uh did a very good job of it and his is a picture of uh the christian life sometimes we fly blind don't we does it feel that way At, during this time i don't know about y'all but this is one of the most confusing times uh, that, that I've ever lived through. At, at the same time, uh, I still understand what God's called me to do. I still understand the place where he's placed me and, and uh, the ministry that he's called me to and the ministry he's called the church to. Those things haven't changed for sure. But boy, the circumstances around us certainly are, are a bit foggy, I would suggest to you. So what we're going to be doing is looking at the life of a particular person, a guy by the name of Philip. He's called, referred to otherwise, it's not in the Bible, but otherwise referred to as Philip the Evangelist as opposed to Philip the Apostle. Uh, this guy was a deacon in the early church, a spirit-filled man and uh, full of wisdom. And we're looking at the events that transpire in his life in pretty rapid succession here in, in chapter 8 and uh, see what we can learn about understanding and following the will of God. Acts chapter 8, look at verse 1. So first of all, let's see how God moves in the life of Philip. He moves through circumstances. And here's the circumstance. We read this last time, but we're read it again. It says, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. This is talking about the previous chapter, which is talking about Stephen. So Stephen was stoned and, and was the first martyr of the church. And on that day, it says a great persecution. Here's the circumstances. Began against the church in Jerusalem. So that's everybody, including the, the deacons. And Philip was one of those guys. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. So, it, so, so here we go. Uh, the first the first situation is that the circumstances put Philip in a place where he didn't want to be. He hadn't planned to be. He hadn't thought about it. In fact, they were bad circumstances. But out of simple necessity, Philip finds himself in Samaria. And uh, God leads through circumstances. Did you know that? Even bad circumstances. I don't think we read everything there that I wanted to read. Keep, let's keep reading all the way down through uh, verse 5. It says, But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He put them in prison, and therefore those who had been scattered went from about preaching the word. Philip went down even to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And the crowds of, of one accord were giving attention to what Philip said, and they heard and saw the signs that he was performing. And for the cause of many had been unclean spirits, and there were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice and many who had been paralyzed were healed and so there was much rejoicing in that city so so philip through a, a bad set of circumstances actually fell right into the will of god isn't that interesting so god's only limited to good circumstances right no god's in charge guys we talked about this last time or the time before god is sovereign 
And so we find ourselves in a bad set of circumstances. Nonetheless, it's where we find ourselves. So, so we need to say, what does God have for me here? And so let's, let's continue on. So God leads through circumstances. And let's skip down to verse 26. I'm going to see a, a second way God led Philip. Uh, take a look at verse, chapter 8 again. Verse 26, we're going to be down through verse 30. It says, on the following day, mm, sorry, I was on the wrong page. <laughs> Turn the page, Bill. Here we go. Verse 26. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, get up and hello, wait a minute. So how do you know the will of God is? Well, the angel of the Lord appears to you. Now, ah, that's pretty easy. Get up. Here's the directive. Go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he's up there in Samaria. He's up there preaching the gospel. There's been a huge revival. There's a massive movement of God. And so God pulls him out of there. And uh, he moves on because the angel says, go to Gaza. And this is the desert road. And so he got up. He went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of Ethiopia, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot was reading the prophet Isaiah and then the spirit said to Philip go up and join this chariot so we have two directives here first the angel says get up and go down to Gaza just start heading that way and then boom he sees this guy in a chariot and the spirit says so he's got a second directive the spirit now says move this is the guy and so Philip ran up heard him reading from Isaiah the prophet and said do you understand that which you're reading of course from there this guy is saved he's baptized and that turns into our next movement of God's so, well let's consider what happens here so first of all we had just circumstances in which Philip was moved to Samaria and then now we have extraordinary circumstances right he sees an angel he hears the voice of the Holy Spirit and um, maybe we should ask the question does God still lead this way some would say no and um, and I'd say you you know you got a right to believe whatever you want to you got a right to be wrong too um, I find absolutely no evidence in the scriptures that says God stopped speaking this way now, to say God always leads this way in every circumstance is certainly not true. Uh, the reason why these instances are recorded in the scriptures is because they're rare. Mostly God doesn't lead this way, but, but, but I don't know if, if, if uh, it might bother you. What if I told you that the primary reason why I'm standing here and why I'm in ministry and my family is involved in ministry is because God, I heard an audible voice from God when I was 17 years old. And you may say, well, that Pastor Bill, we always thought he was crazy. And I, I would say, and I've been trying to tell you all that the whole time. Uh, think whatever you want to, uh, but it is the reason. It is the reason. It is the reason why I began ministry. So let's look at the, the third time that God leads, God directs the will of God into the life of Philip. Continue reading here. Skip down to verse 39 of chapter 8. So, so he's witness to this, to this Ethiopian eunuch. The man's gotten saved. He says... Uh, uh, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? He baptizes him, and then it says in verse 39, it says, and when he came up out of the water, so he puts the guy into the water, comes back up, and what, notice what happens. The Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the unit no longer saw him, wow, but went on his way rejoicing. So the eunuch's headed south, and Philip basically heads north, or the Spirit brings him north. And Philip found himself in Azotus. That's like... 50 miles away. So he brings him through this spiritual dimension portal or something. And as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel. So, so, so now the third time God leads Philip is this divine intervention. I know the, know the way to put it. And so Philip's conclusion is this must be where I'm supposed to be because this is where I am. And, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said for that kind of conclusion. Um, sometimes we wonder, you know, what's going on in my life? Well, uh, let me just say this to you. It might be that this is where you are, so this is where you're supposed to be. So start with that. Start with that. We, we oftentimes, well, what's the will of God? We're always thinking about something over there, uh, something new, something different, something whatever. Well, maybe the will of God is where you're supposed to, where you already are. And so you do start that. Start with that for sure. This must be where God wants me to be because this is where I am. And that's a, that's a great answer to the question of what is God's will for my life. And so start with that. Anyway, that, a question we're going to be answering together is this morning or this, this afternoon is uh, how can we know God's will and his direction for our lives so that we can follow his lead? Now, Philip had it pretty easy there. First of all, the circumstances weren't easy. I mean, the first time he moved out of Jerusalem, was kind of scratching your head saying, I thought we were supposed to be here. This is where the early church was, just speaking on behalf of Philip there. But then 
The next time when the angel speaks to him and the Holy Spirit speaks to him, and then the Spirit of God picks him up and sets him in another place 50 miles away, no question about what he's supposed to be doing in those circumstances. And so wouldn't it be nice if um, that's the way God always did things? There would be no, no uncertainty about what he wants us to do. But the fact is, guys, that that's the far exception rather than the rule. 99.99% .99 of the time, that is not the way God leads. It's not the way he leads. So, so it's not so God's will isn't so easily discerned as it was in the case of Philip. So how do we know his will? when the fog gets thick. So let, let me give you a, a, a few rules of thumb here and, and uh, pulling it out of scripture and pulling it out of the story of, of Philip. But uh, before we can, well, first of all, number one, well, number one, before we get to number one, is just simply this. We're actually assuming something here. Here's the assumption that we actually want to do the will of God. Do you, a little heart searching here, do you really want to know the will of God? Because here, here's what I know. If you do, then you will. If you don't, then you won't. That's really how it works. If you do, then you will. If you really want to know the will of God. Donald Gray Barnhouse put it this way. 95% of knowing the will of God consists of being willing to do it before you know what it is. Do you really want to do the will of God. Do you really believe that God knows what he's doing and that what he's doing is the best thing for you? Now you got to start there. Now if we can't get past that threshold, it really doesn't matter. The other things are just academic of knowing what his will is. Do you, do you really trust him? You see, is that, is that really the, in your heart? Because if you want to know the will of God, then you'll know the will of God. You will. God will make it clear to you. And that's just a rule of thumb, broad, broad as it is, but nonetheless, it works that way. So number two, once you overcome the obstacle of your own will, the next step is to memorize, as it was true for the case of that little pilot, memorize the rule book. If you don't know what the rule book says, then how are you going to know the will of God? How, how are you going to hear the, the air traffic controller, if you will, will, in your ear when you don't know what the rule book says, uh, what he's already said? How are you going to know? So probably not possible to memorize this book, uh, but certainly reading it and dwelling on it and holding it close to your heart is absolutely imperative uh, when you're flying by the seat of your pants. And uh, believe me, we all are. I, I want us to hear, I want you to listen carefully to uh, what God, just some excerpts of what God has to say about his own word. Take a look at this. Throw it on the screen there for you. Joshua 1, 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it, how often? Just two times a day, day and night, so that you may be careful to do all, according to all that is written in it, for then, mark it carefully, then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Listen, apart from the rule book, you're not landing this thing well. Apart from the rule book, you're not gonna know where you're going. You have to know the rule book. Let's, let's take a look at the next verse. This is uh, uh, from uh, Psalm 1. How blessed, it says, is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of coffers. So some things that you need to stay away from, number one. And number two, some things you need to add. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates. There's that two times a day thing, right? Day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. Same thing, same thing that was told to Joshua. Meditate on this. What does it mean to meditate? You just put it by your head and fall asleep? No. It means to read it, to think about it, to chew it over, to mull it over, to see how it applies to your life. You don't have to read a gigantic portion of it. It can be a small portion of it. But let me tell you something. You've got to have the rule book constantly on your mind and on your heart. Let's, let's, let's look at one more place. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16 and 17. Paul's advice is he's leaving this world to his young protege, Timothy. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Wouldn't you consider the will of God to be a good work? Yeah. 
How do you get equipped for that? <laughs> the Word of God. You've got to have it. There's no substitute for it. Without a firm commitment to the rule book, you're not going to make it. You're not going to land this thing, or it won't land well. So, so the second, thing, second step is memorize the rule book. Third, third step is to ask for guidance. And that may seem, you know, uh, like a no-brainer, but, but a lot of times when, when you and I are actually think we're asking for guidance, what we're actually saying is, God, do you, we want God's approval for something we've already decided to do. That's not what this is. That's not seeking the will of God. I, I mean, yes, you could. You know, I stumbled into this, God. Is this what you want? But sometimes we just already have a decision of what we're going to do, and we're just asking God to, to bless it. And that's not how this works. A lot of the time, uh, that's what we're doing. We ask for, ask for guidance really is leaving the options all to God. Again, go back to Donald Gray Barnhouse. 95% of knowing the will of God consists in being willing to do it before you know what it is. Whatever your will is, God. Whatever it is, I don't care. Just simply blanking your heart out saying, God, it's not my will, but your will. Can you get there? Can you get there? It's going to be hard to know the will of God apart from that. It's going to be hard. Asking guidance is really leaving the options all to God. Before you can find the will of God, you must trust that God's will is the best thing for you. And do you believe that? I said you've got to cross that threshold. So that's the third step. The fourth step is to expect an answer. Again, no-brainer, right? But a lot of times we pray and then we don't think about it anymore. You know, listen, when, when you ask God a question, start looking for an answer. I mean immediately. That day. That day. And, and where do we find God's answers? Well, there's a number of avenues that God uses. First of all, He uses the rule book. Probably in my life, the rule book... The Bible has been the primary means through which God has spoken to me. I've gotten many directives, many, many corrections, many, many uh, leadings, many things, and uh, probably 90% of them has come from this book. 90% of them have come in just sitting down on a regular basis, on a, on a habitual uh, basis, day by day, mulling over, reading, contemplating, meditating on the rule book. And you say, well, how... How could a Bible that was written, you know, 2,000 years ago possibly pertain to my situation as I'm looking at changing jobs? Well, you'd be surprised. Let it do what it does. So first of all, God answers through his word. Secondly, answers through prayer. We're spending time in prayer, praising him, seeking him. Look how many options, how many, how many times in the scriptures someone has been praying and God spoke to him. Read the book of Daniel. Book of Daniel is full of times that Daniel's praying and God comes through with these visions and these answers and these circumstances. And, and such an example of a faithful person who, through prayer, God spoke to him. And then a third option, a third way, a third avenue through which God speaks is through the church. He speaks through his church, through the giftedness of his church. First of all, the giftedness in, in preaching and teaching. Are you submitting yourself to that? Here I am asking you that and while I'm preaching and teaching to you, right? Well, of course I am, Pastor Bill. Well, are you being consistent at it? You know, sometimes we, we, we get real consistent at listening to preachers and teachers when we want an answer and the rest of the time we do not. And let me tell you something, that's not how it works. You, you got to have a consistent diet of this. You need to be connected with good preachers and good teachers and stick with them. Not because these guys and gals necessarily know what they're doing, because I can tell you, I don't. I don't know what's going on in your life. God doesn't come to me and talk to me about what's happening or what his will for your life is. But I'm telling you, God uses people like me. And I, I can say that with confidence because it's been the same way for me. I mean, a lot of them, a lot of leadership I've gotten in life has been through good preaching and teaching someone else's. And, and, and God has spoken to me and he's moved me in, in a direction. And I've seen many people whose lives were just radically changed because God used some preacher who had no idea who he was talking to under no circumstances that he know how powerful that message was. And yet God used that message to change a person's life. And so are you, do you have that avenue open? But it, it, listen, it's not just preachers and teachers. It's the giftedness of the body. We put too much on preachers and teachers and say, I've got to have good preachers and teachers in life. Yeah, you do. But you've also got to have good members. Good members. You need to have surrounding you. Listen, you want to know the will of God? Surround yourself with people who have a history of actually doing the will of God in their lives. Surround yourself. Look at your friends right now. Who's closest to you? Are these actually people who have a track record of following God? Because if they're not, 
If they're not, I'm not saying disassociate yourself with them, but listen, you really want to know the will of God? You're going to have to associate with people who, who have walked it and talked it, who really know. And, and then ask them to pray for you, those people, and then tell them to give you their objective opinion. You really want to know the will of God? Listen, God will speak through that. He really will. So he speaks through the Bible, he speaks through prayer, he speaks through his church, he speaks through number four, circumstances. We saw this in the life of, uh, in, in, in the, in the life of Philip. Uh, uh, this must be where I'm supposed to be because this is where I am kind of thing. Yep, that's exactly right. Closed doors, open doors, uh, opportunities. You need to be asking, asking God the question, is this something you have for me? Uh, part, a large portion of the reason why I'm at this church is because just simply circumstances circumstances. I, I pastored another church. Everything was going great. I loved it there. Uh, still love the people there, miss those people. And then all of a sudden, boom, some circumstances started to come together. And I hadn't even talked to Island Baptist Church. Island Baptist Church didn't exist as far as I was concerned. And I came home from my office and some of you heard my testimony. I came home from my office and I told Valerie, I don't know what's going on, sweetie, but I'm telling you, we're about to move somewhere. I just feel it. I just feel it. And, uh, Sure enough, within a, within a week, I heard from the pulpit committee of this church. And so here I am, 20, going on 20 years later. Um, again, God moved through circumstances. And the fifth way that he moves, and the rarest way, I should say, is through the supernatural. I mean, God is supernatural, don't you know? He is supernatural. So it shouldn't shock us if he does come to us with an audible voice. It shouldn't shock us. Uh, he can do that. Now, there's a lot of people who live their entire lives and would love to hear the voice of God and, and do not. And in fact, I would say the vast, vast majority of believers throughout the ages have not heard an audible voice. Uh, but can God do that? Yes, certainly. It's completely within the prerogative of God. He completely has all those uh, options laid out before him. It'd be great if we could all have that. Uh, we just don't. I had the one occasion in my life that I, that I mentioned before. And I've not had another occasion since. And I can honestly tell you that occasion was so frightening that I would kind of rather not go that way ever again. Uh, those of us who have ever had that happen to you, you'll they'll tell you, man, you don't want that to happen again. That's scary stuff. Uh, just it, at least it was for me. So, so do you want to know the will of God? Do you really want to know? Do you really want to see him move in your life? Do you really want to hear him? Uh, do, do you really believe that his will for you is the best thing? Well, listen, if you really want to know, uh, then you'll know. You really want to know, then you'll spend the time in the Word. You'll spend the time in prayer. You'll spend the time talking to believers. You'll spend the time listening uh, for Him. You'll, you'll spend the time looking at your circumstances and saying, what, is, what does God have for me? Do you really want to know? Believe me, you will know. Let's pray together. God, I thank You that You lead us. I thank you that you're the great shepherd and that we're the sheep and we confess to you that our way is not the right way and our, our idea of how things should work is not the right way it should work. But that through circumstances, through prayer, through, through your word, through your, through your church, through the supernatural, uh, you still lead. And so we're trusting you, Lord, in these dark days, in these cloudy and foggy circumstances that we find ourselves in, that, Lord, you're going to show us how to fly this uh, uh, by your rule book and by your voice in our ears. Thank you so much, Lord, for speaking to us. Thank you for your word, Lord. We trust ourselves to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.